Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, thank you all for taking time to come and um, can you all hear me well? Yeah? Uh, for taking this, um, uh, these breaths for us to spend. Um, it might seem like a strange topic for us to take an evening to address love and in particular uh, extreme love, radical love, ishq, this uh, luminous and bold and fierce tradition at a time that the world seems um, so extraordinarily broken and breaking um, and to see people who represent the very opposite of that um, in so many places around the world. Um, it is perhaps precisely at the time that the night seems quite dark and that it's helpful to remember to look for stars and to remember the role of, um, of light and guidance. And I think in a world which at times seems to be run amok with narcissism and cruelty, um, it's precisely to remember the salvific and actually alchemical nature of love. Uh, and, and to also redeem love from being something that is simply fluff and mushy and sentimental. Um, quite a sentimental person myself, so I don't use the sentimental as a derogatory. Um, but love has become so collapsed, it has become so privatized, and it has actually become so sexualized. That's the only outlet that many of us feel comfortable using this language of love is in um, a rather physical, sexual, romantic nature. But the mystics that we are uh, here to talk about this evening, they speak of love in this ever expansive notion. They talk about the love of a parent, the love of a child, of a brother, a sister, a teacher a student, a friend, a neighbor, a stranger, and all of these as being connected to the love of God. And since the way that um, those mystics that I'm um, most familiar with is to begin with uh, stories and poetry that stay with you, this will be the majority of what I will um, try to share with you this evening. And uh, I'll try to tell you where some of these stories come from so that you have a chance to, to look them up. Uh, many of these are in this collection, uh, Radical Love, which uh, came out recently. Uh, you're welcome to look for it there. There are, of course, illegal Russian websites that you can go to and illegally download the copy as well, like everybody else does. Um, so um, we'll begin with talking about not the most well-known exemplar of Ishq in the Islamic tradition, who is, of course, the great Molana uh, Jalal al-Din Balkhi, known in the West as Rumi. Um, and I will not begin with him, because the way that we tend to talk about Rumi is generally as a one-off, as if he just appears like a meteor in a dark night, uh, comes from nowhere and just goes on his own path. Um, and I'm going to encourage us to instead think about these giants as being something like Mount Everest. Right? Everest might be uh, a zenith, but Everest doesn't stand alone. Everest stands supported by the Himalayas, by these mountainous range that are propping the ones that stand even a little bit taller, supporting them propelling them to even ever higher heights. So we don't get a Molana Rumi alone. He stands on the shoulders of Attar and Sana'i and Ahmad Ghazali and Kharagani, and they stand on the shoulders of Imam Ali and the Prophet. So I'm trying to help us see this as an unfolding of a vast tradition uh, that actually continues right down to our own age. Right? This is a living tradition. This is not something that we have to go to a museum and look at as an artifact. Um, so Molana 
was quite familiar with these earlier mystics who had come before him, and he loves to cite them, he loves to refer to them. And one of the beings that he cites very frequently is Fariduddin Attar. Uh, Attar, who's probably, along with Sana'i, uh, that point in which that exquisite tradition of poetry and of Sufism come together in Persian in that configuration that we know. He writes a number of books, and one of them is called Tazkaratul Awliya, the memoirs of the saints, the friends of God, if you prefer. Uh, he tells the story of a wonderful um, Egyptian mystic, uh, in Arabic, Zulnun al-Misri, in Persian, Zulnun, Zulnun the Egyptian. Uh, and in this age, apparently, people were having visionary experiences of God and the Prophet all the time. Right? To have a dream in which you heard the voice of God or you perhaps even got to see the Prophet, um, this did not require medication. Uh, this was actually a sign of a vibrant spiritual life. So Zulnun has this dream, Attar tells us, in which all the human beings who have ever been, all the ones who are, and all the ones who shall forever be, are brought together in the day to come, in the hereafter. And they experience the voice of God coming to them, <coughs> offering them a series of gifts without a judgment, without any mention of the scale, Right? freely, unconditionally bestowed gifts. And they can choose to receive them or not. And so the first gift comes, who here wishes to attain to the sum total of all the earthly delights and pleasures? So the people sort of look around themselves and it sounds pretty good, and so about 90% of them put up their hands, sum total of all the pleasures and they keep waiting for the catch, and there is no catch. The voice of God comes, it is granted unto you. So they're quite grateful, and they receive that pleasure, and they leave. They experience the voice of God a second time. Who here wishes to receive salvation from any pain, any suffering, and the torment of hellfire? They look around, that's no pain, no suffering, no hellfire, that sounds pretty good. 90% so of those who are left raise their hands, and again they wait for it, and there's no catch. It is granted unto you. So they get it, and they leave. Smaller crowd left now. Who here wishes to be granted entry into my loftiest paradise, a garden so luminous that no eye has ever seen and no word has ever described. Mm. That sounds really good. Garden, so luminous, no eyes ever seen, no words ever described. So about 90% of those left raise their hand. It is granted unto you, and they leave, and then there's just a handful of people still left. And Zulnun says that this time they experienced the voice of God coming at them, not gently, but like a thunder. I gave you the sum total of all the pleasures. You chose it not. I gave you a chance to be free from all pain, all suffering, and hellfire. You chose it not. I gave you the chance to be in that loftiest and most luminous garden, you chose it not. What are you here for? And so Noon says that this handful of people who are left lower their head in humility, and they said, the one who asks knows better. We did not come for pleasure. We did not come to be spared pain and hellfire. And we didn't even come for the luminous garden. We came for you. Then a fourth and final time, they hear the voice of God switching again to the most gentle Jamali voice, saying, in that case, I am yours. I am yours. There have always been these few mystics, seekers after God's own heart, 
for whom the goal is the beloved. Right? Salvation, redemption, being saved from hellfire, these are lovely byproducts of that relationship. And they are unabashed, unashamed, about the fact that this relationship of love, of ish, of a love that is like a fire, right? of a love that consumes you and burns you. This love is like a flame that burns away the nafs, the ego. That this love would not be possible if you were not already loved first by Allah. Bless you. So many of them begin, as all of these Sufis do, with the Quran, with select hadiths of the Prophet, in particular the sacred hadith, the Hadith Qudsi tradition, and not only the sayings of the beloved Prophet, not only the actions of the beloved Prophet, but really the very being of the Prophet. This path of love transforms the way that we relate to Allah and the way that we relate to the Prophet. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those elements. In speaking about Allah, they almost always start with that famous Hadith Qudsi, Kuntu kenzan makhfiyan fahbabtu anorfa. I was a hidden treasure and I loved, I loved to be known intimately. So right there you have a divine love, a divine yearning, a God who is reaching out and desiring to be known but not just known here. In the Arabic language, we've got all these wonderful words for knowing. And there's a kind of knowing which is a mere discursive knowledge. But ain, ra, fa, ma'rafa, that's different. That's a knowledge in your bones. That's a knowledge in your heart. That's the difference between someone writing on this board, H-O-N-E-Y, and someone bringing a bowl of honey in here. And what they tell you is that what the majority of people do is that there's someone standing up front who takes their finger in the honey and they put it in their mouth and they say, hmm, it's quite sweet. And most people who consider themselves religious say, I have faith that he said that the honey is sweet. They want you to come and take the honey and put it in your own mouth and taste of that sweetness. And of course, when the honey is in your mouth, your mouth is closed. There's no need to actually speak anymore. Fortunately for us, they do speak and at great length. But that this notion of our love for God is deeply connected to the divine love for us is something that they connect to that passage in the Quran that God will bring forth a people, yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahu. He loves them and they will love Allah. This relationship that they have with the divine always has a vertical dimension. That vertical dimension never disappears. Right? God is always the Lord. But to that element, if you would, of transcendence, they also add an element of intimacy, deep and close intimacy. So people like Abu Nu'aym al-Isfahani, from my hometown, he says, when I'm out in public, I will call you Lord. When we are in private, I will call you my beloved. In public, there is a decorum, there is an adab that you continue to observe, but when we are alone, I will address you as my beloved. Um, there is a tenderness and intimacy in a tradition where respect and adab and transcendence and the Lord-servant relationship is the basis, that's the foundation. And you add to that foundation this element of affection. Affection even so much that sometimes you hear them use the word friendship. 
دوستی to have a friendship with God it's something quite foreign to the way that we oftentimes speak about Allah um, in Sahla Tostari, one of these early mystics, he was asked, what is this path of love that you speak about? And his answer was, Ba khuda rahat budan. To be at ease with God. To be at ease with God. Um, Shibli, another famous early mystic, said, how do you experience God? And his answer was, I experience God the way that a toddler experiences being in his mama's lap, right? That deep sense of you're safe, you are loved, you are protected. Right? They keep the language of the regal lordship and they add this language to it. And sometimes this, the tenderness in this language um, leads them to, to a place which is somewhat rare in Islamic devotional literature. Um, Islamic literatures are filled with great examples of humor, but usually when we are at the human to human level, like a little bit less common is humor in terms of our human divine relationship, um, but not on this path of love. One of the mystics that I will mention, and the translations are in this book, is um, a simple shepherd from the Khurasan region named Abu al-Hasan al-Kharagani. Right? This is one of these giants of early Sufism um, who was not a particularly learned scholar. Right? He didn't go to a university, he didn't go to a madrasa. Um, he simply poured out his love for the divine. And um, so, you know, he has another one of these visionary dreams of God. And God is teasing him playfully, um, calls him Bul Hasana, Hassan's daddy. Right? Bul Hasana, do you want me to go and tell the town people about every little dirty secret that I see in your heart? Do you want me to tell them all the ways that you fall short? Do you want me to tell them of all your acts of hypocrisy that only I see? And if I do, they will stone you. Kharagani right? doesn't miss a beat. He talks back to God the way that you would to a friend and says, my loving Lord, do you want me to go into the town and tell them just how intensely you love them? And if I do, then they will know that you love them more than a mother loves her newborn child and you will never throw any of them into hellfire. And if I do, then not a single one of them is going to pray or fast or do all the things that you've told us to do. Right? And then Kharagani says, there's a long pause and the voice of God says, Nazman, Nazto. How about this? I say nothing, you say nothing. Right? Now, what makes these stories work is that these are the same mystics who never miss a prayer. Right? It is not that this loving relationship and this friendship is a license to get out of prayer. They are known precisely for being the most observant. Because prayer for him is not gymnastics. They speak about prayer as a chance to have your own mi'raj. Right? It is an ascension to stand in front of the Lord of all the universes. This is a little unusual for us to grasp because in modern, western, secular society, religion is more or less an individualistic choice. You can choose to do your salat, or you cannot. And largely speaking, there's not going to be someone coming and dragging you to salat. Right? Medieval Muslim society was a different world in which the public performance of prayer was common, expected, meritorious, and a part of your social standing. Right? So what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to do the things that you're supposed to do, but do them, perform them with presence, with intentionality. Right? That's how you get these stories from people like Molana Rumi, that a follower of his um, 
is doing his prayers the way that many of us do, trying to fit it at time in the halftime of a football game or something. Um, and he comes to Molana, and Molana says to him, you did not pray. He sends him back. Uh, the guy does it quickly again and comes, you did not pray. Three times he sends him back and it's like, I did it! He says, you did, but there was no huzur, there was no presence. Right? You have to be fully present in that, in that prayer. And this deep relationship of intimacy with the divine is one that comes to shape their entire outlook, their whole relationship. Um, you know, here you come across some of the names that are quite familiar um, in the history of Islamic spirituality, but you start to get a sense of the richness of this relationship. Um, I'll, t I'll read for you a couple of stories from, from the book. Um, and the great Rabia is, of course, so well known. Khudavanda, um, O oh Lord, اگر تو را از خوف دوزخ می پرستم در دوزخم بسوز و اگر به امید بهشت می پرستم بر من حرام گردان و اگر از برای تو تو را می پرستم جمال باقی از من دریق مدار My loving Lord, if I worship you for fear of hell, burn me in that hell. If I worship you hoping for paradise, make it forbidden for me. But if I worship you only for your own sake, do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. Jamal al-Baqi. And you see mystics like her and um, there's a wonderful new book that has come out from Rukia Cornell talking about the many rabias, the many faces of rabia, um, that I, I do recommend. But you also see the way in which um, they are pushing back against understandings and practices which tend to restrict God to our understanding of the divine. Right? They want a bigger God, a grander God, a God whose mercy and love and compassion would be almost unimaginable for us. Um, we have another story in here from Attar that um, Rabia is walking past and uh, there's some sheikh somewhere perhaps sitting on a member and he's um, preaching and this is the story that many of us know from the Bible. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Right? She pauses and she pokes her head in and she's like, what did you say? And the, the, the man who's a little annoyed at having been interrupted like I said, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And she looks at him and says, my friend, the door was never closed. Right? The door has never been closed. Another Sufi takes that same story, right? These stories are sometimes so good that you get multiple variations of them. One of them says, you're knocking and knocking and knocking at God's door. You're knocking from the inside you're actually already with the Divine Presence. There is no place that the Beloved is not. And the analogy that they use for it is the womb. Right? There's a famous hadith from the Prophet that Ibn Arabi and these Sufis all use, reminding you that the words Rahman and Rahim, the two most frequent of the Divine Names, come from the root for Rahim, which is the womb, and Ibn Arabi develops that hadith to a full extent of saying, Kanna. It's as if the entire cosmos is contained within the divine womb. As if. And in a language, in a religious imagination, which avoids speaking of God as the father or as the mother, right? This is a very strong feminine imagery to actually see the divine as encompassing you. And Kharagani says, you are in God as a fish is in the ocean. And a fish has no word for the ocean. 
that God is invisible to you from the superabundance. The only way that you would know that you're in the ocean of divinity is if the fish could be taken out. And what is going to make you be outside of the divine? Now, this language of hub and mahabba had been there from the very beginning. What sets the particular path of radical love is the cultivation of ishq as not only a fierce form of love, a bold form of love, but also love as practice. So love is not just poetry, love is not just an aesthetic, but love is the practice that is supposed to transform how we look at each other, how we touch one another, how we speak with one another. And this path is usually traced, as always, to the prophet, to the Quran, to the Prophet's encounter with God at the height of the Mi'raj, and in Islamic history to the writings of Imam al-Ghazali's younger brother named Ahmad, Ahmad al-Ghazali. Um, there's a whole separate conversation that one could have about the more famous Imam al-Ghazali, who of course has an epistemological crisis. There's also political components to that. And he is sitting at the highest post in the most elegant madrasa in the whole world at that time, the Nizamiya. And he's like, how do I know? How do I know that anything is real? Ah! And he runs away for seven years. Who takes his place? Ahmad Ghazali. Right? So this is not some marginal figure. This is the most distinguished professor of the highest madrasa in the world. What does Ahmad Ghazali write? He writes the first distinct Persian text on the tradition of Ishq. And he begins that book with Yuhibbuhum wa Yuhibbunahu, with a line of poetry, and then he says, my friend here asked me to write him a book on love, and I agreed on one condition that you never again make a bifurcation between the love of God and the love of humanity. Because love is one. There is, that's the great Bob Marley moment, there is <laughs> one love. And then in other writings, they go on to say, this ishq is actually not even one of the sifat. It's not just an attribute of God. It's not that Allah is al-wudud, the loving. No, no. People like Fakhreddin Iraqi say this very expressively. Ishq is the very being of Allah. And they say, this love is what erupts out of the divine, brings creation into being, sustains you and nourishes you here. And if you can learn to love other human beings purely, right? not through your ego, not through what can I get out of this transaction, and if I say I love you, can I then touch you there? But if your love can be purified and you merge into this divine current of love, then the same love will carry you back home. And Ahmad Ghazali says, this is the starting point of the path of love. To realize that our love for humanity is inseparable from the love of the divine. <clears throat> Many of these teachers, of these teachings, talk about this in a poetic sensibility. So I'm going to read for you now with that little background. And people like Molana Rumi very much identifies himself as a follower in this path of love, mazhab ishq right? This is not to take the place of the legal schools, the theological schools, the philosophical schools, but it animates them. It enriches them. So Molana Rumi is, in the daytime, 
He's a professor of Islamic law in a madrasa in Konya. You never set aside the tradition of Islamic law, but you add to that. So being mindful of time, I'm going to read for you one of the famous poems of Molana and a translation that I have here for it. Um, he starts out with this. Um, Man qulam qamaram qayd qamar hich magu Pish man jus sukhan sham o shikar hich magu I serve that moonlike beauty say nothing to me unless it's about her speak nothing of sorrow speak only words of this treasure and then he has a vision Last night, I became love-crazed. Love, personified, saw me and said, I've come. Don't shout. Say nothing. Rumi answered, yeah, but I've tried this love thing before and I've gotten hurt real bad. I said, love, I'm afraid of something else. Love said, there is nothing else. <coughs> say nothing. Let me whisper secrets in your ear. Say nothing. And then at this point, Molana is trying to figure out, what, who, who are you? What are you? Like, are you, are you human? Are you an angel? I said, what a beauty. Are, are, are you an angel or a human? Love said, not an angel, not a human, say nothing. Then he just goes into full-on freak-out mode. So okay, if you're not a human and you're not an angel, that leaves. Goftam in chist begu zero zebar khoham shod. Goft mi bosh chenin zero zebar. Heech magu. I said, what is this? Say it. Love said, stay like this. Say nothing. Goftam ay dil pedari kun, nake in vasve khodast. Goft in hast, vali jan pedar, hich magu. I said, my heart isn't what you're describing, God. Love said, Yes, my child, but hush, say nothing. They're not writing a prose metaphysical treatise for you, right? This is in that realm of poetry which alludes and hints and then gets you to become a participant in that process. Um, I'm mindful of the time. Those of you um, who feel um, a, a desire to have your own mirage with the Divine Beloved, this would be a lovely time to, to leave, and uh, there's no judgment. Um, and those of you who should so choose to stay, could we go until 7 o'clock for those who can stay? Okay, feel free to, to do that. Um, and feel free to also go and come back as you, as you so like. Okay. So, the way that this path of love changes their relationship with Allah also changes their connection and intimacy with the Prophet. With the Prophet. Uh, remember that Molana Rumi, who you know, nowadays has been turned into some kind of New Age hippie California sage, um, he was called in his own lifetime Farzand John Mustafa, uh, the offspring of the soul of the Prophet. Right? That's what people consider him, the offspring of the soul of the Prophet. And um, Attar tells a really powerful story, which is all a play on the common form of veneration for the Prophet when he's called An-Nabi al-Ummi. 
right? which we usually translate as um, the unlettered prophet. Right? The prophet whose wisdom and whose knowledge comes not from mere human knowledge. Right? A particularly bad translation of it, the illiterate prophet. Right? For a tradition which is all based on the sanctification of knowledge, right? the illiterate prophet. Uh, unlettered prophet, a little bit better. Attar and Molana Rumi and others say, well, no, actually, look at the root of the word. And Nabi al-Ummi, who is your um? Your mother. He is the maternal prophet. He is the prophet that loves you more than your mother does. And he, Attar then takes that pun and makes it into a story. And here's the story. It's also in this book. Attar tells you that there's a woman who's carrying her child by a river. Right? You've got beautiful canals here in Cambridge. I've enjoyed walking them today. Uh, and she's walking and the water is gushing. And at one point, she slips and the baby falls into the river. And she has that existential panic of seeing your child go under the water. And the child is trying to swim, but he cannot swim. And so she, but she doesn't know how to swim either. And so she's filled with agony. And then she looks ahead, and the same stream is actually headed for a mill. And so if the child doesn't drown, then he's going to get crushed under the stone mill. And so she does what hopefully any of us would do in that situation. She leaps. She jumps in and she manages to rescue the child. And she comes to the shore. And the baby is just beside herself, utterly distraught. And what she doesn't do is that she doesn't give the baby a pep talk. She doesn't say, well, you know, see, you, you didn't die. And that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There, there, young chap, it will be fine. Right? Stiff upper lip, I think is what you British folks tend to call it. She provides care and love directly in the only way that she knows in that moment. She takes her breast and directly puts it in the mouth of the baby and she nurses and suckles the baby. Right? It's a tender, intimate act. And at this point in the story, Attar switches from the narrative of the woman and her child to talking about the Ummah and the Nabi al-Ummi of the Muslim community addressing the Prophet. And Attar says, Ya Rasulullah, we are drowning in this ocean of sin. We are going under, we are in this pathetic, wretched state, as so many of us are in today's world. Shir deh mara zepestane karam. Suckle us, nurse us, O Messenger of Allah, from the breast of kindness, of compassion, of generosity. It's, it's this tender, loving, maternal relationship that, um, that they have with, um, with the Prophet as well, which I think is um, it's a powerful, powerful reminder. Um, this same kind of a tradition is one that leads them to transform how we are with one another. It changes your relationship with Allah, it changes your relationship with the Prophet, um, and it changes your connection with your fellow human beings. If you love God, you have to love humanity. Um, there's a wonderful story that Molana Rumi tells in the Masnavi. The same story is also told in Saadi's Gulistan and many other sources. This is the famed Layla and Majnoon story, the archetypal Muslim love story. Um, Majnoon has become so enchanted with Layla that he loses his own name. Right? He just becomes the love crazed one, Majnoon Layla. He becomes Layla's. And he writes all these beautiful poems describing Layla. And the word of this gets to the king of the time. In one version, he's described as the Khalifa of the time. 
who says, well, if any woman is this beautiful, then I have to meet her. So he summons all the women from Layla's village to be brought to his court. And he's just tingling with excitement that he's finally going to get to meet Layla, the woman who would have inspired such a sublime love poetry. And he walks in, and he's so happy to be seeing Layla, and he looks, and he's expecting one of these women to just stand out from all the other ones. And he comes to the court, and he looks at the crowd of women gathered in front of him, and he looks, and he looks, and he looks, but there's no single one who surfaces above the others. They all look, as my daughter, who was 18, would call them, basic. And so the king is very puzzled, and he turns to his advisor, did you bring Layla? She's here. So he goes and addresses the women, and he goes, is, is one of you all Layla? Right? In this tradition, people talk back. Layla steps forward. She looks basic. And the king is like, you? You are that Layla that inspired that poem? And Layla says, I am Layla, but you are not Majnun. Right? And then the commentary that Molana Rumi adds is, in order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to learn to look through the eyes of Majnun. And what Ahmad al-Ghazali says is that your eyes have to become born again. You have to learn to look through the glance of love. You have to learn to speak the words of love. Your feet have to walk the path of love. That love is not an emotion, it is a transformation of your faculties. And that your body needs to become cooked, sweetened, ripened in this love. The same mystic that we've talked about a couple of times, Kharaqani, he puts this in even simpler language. He says, if you get up in the morning and until you go to bed at night time, you have managed to not break a heart and to not bring harm to any human. It is as if you spent that entire day in the company of all the prophets. Atar takes that same love and tenderness and puts it in a context of service. If you love someone, you also have to serve them. And he tells the story of two brothers who have an elderly mother right, who has a hard time moving, has a hard time taking care of herself. But the two brothers have a very different temperament. It says that one of them doesn't really concern himself with the mother. He just spends all day and all night in prayer. And says, well, my brother is taking care of the mom. And the other brother, he stays up at nights with, them, with their mother. Uh, mother, are you thirsty? Uh, mother, can I get you a bite to eat? Um, Mom, do you need to go to the loo? Let me carry you. Right? And so one night, the praying brother has, what else? A dream of God. And God says to him, Mubarak, congratulations. For the sake of your brother, I've decided to forgive both of your sins. And this brother is quite pleased. And he says, well, thank you, Ya Allah, what a gift. Um, but clearly, you're a little confused. Clearly, what you mean to say, O Lord of all the universes, is that for my sake and all the prayers that I've done all day and all night, you're forgiving my brother, who doesn't pray as much as I do. And the voice of God comes back to him and say, no, no, I'm fairly clear about whom I'm speaking to. 
that which you do for me, I have no need of. But your mother needs you. But your mother needs you. And again, this isn't a tradition in which you pray to five times a day and you do all the supererogatory prayers and they're reminding you, don't forget about service. Don't forget about love. Don't forget about tenderness. Right? It's not a choice between do I pray or do I serve. It's making sure that your piety is not a dry kind of piety, that your piety is moist, it's sweet. That's the way that Molana Rumi talks about the prophet. He says, the prophets are like a sweet apple tree. All the prophets grew at the same time on the street. This is a Muslim story, so our beloved looks a little bit better in this story. Just bear with it. He says, and the prophets were picked from the Shajarat al-Nabuwa, the, the tree of prophethood, at different times. So, Hazrat Adam was picked, and then Noah, and then Ibrahim, and then Musa, and then Isa, and then our Habib. He says, our prophet stayed on the tree of prophethood longest. That's why he's the sweetest. And he says, when you go to the orchard, pay attention to the trees. A cypress tree, which stands tall and holds its head high, doesn't have any sweet fruit to offer you. He said, but a fruit tree that is pregnant with sweet, succulent fruit, its branches are even hanging on the ground. And he says, the sweeter the fruit, the dustier the branches. And it says, and none of the prophets were dustier, earthier, chokitar, than our beloved Habib. Right? So it's kind of changing the narrative that um, the ones closest to God are the ones closest to humanity. These are the ones who take their love and they bring it forth a tender, loving service in that way. <clears throat> I think in the interest of time, we could, of course, you know, go on and um, go on and on. But in the interest of time, I think what I will do is um, um, perhaps kind of uh, stop in here and uh, read for you one quick last poem. Um, it would be hard for me to pick one just one poem as, you know, my favorite poem. It's kind of like choosing among my children. Um, uh, you love all of your children. You might occasionally like one of them more at a certain time. I think the parents in the room know what I'm talking about. Or you might like how they are in that moment more, but you love all of them. Um, but this is uh, a poem that I like quite very much from Molana Rumi. Um, when you love someone, he says, you project yourself beyond yourself. You leap up to love them and to be with them. And before, the idol that you bow down at is the idol of your own ego. Right? The world is about me and mine. Right? What is the Pharaoh's great sin? That he said, I. And only God can say I. When you love someone, it's about you. Right? Kharagani says, I need to repent from any time that I've ever said to Allah, I love you. Because when I said I love you, I was still hanging on to that notion of I. It's like, I just want to lose that I. I just want it to be about you. Right? He says, um, when in the Quran we hear that primordial call, Alastu barabbikum, right? am I not your Lord? He says, Everyone heard it as, am I not your Lord? Some heard it as, am I not your doost? Am I not your friend? So, but someday we must hear this as, am I not all? Am I not the only I? The only one that exists? So Molana talks about this 
but in a loving context, and this is our parting words, and I would love to maybe take a couple of questions if you have the time. And it's this love propelling you beyond yourself, right? letting go of this transactional notion of our human encounter. And he simply says this, you and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. You and I have to live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. Um, thank you for the gift of your time. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim, for your kindness, for your hospitality and welcoming me here. And um, it's an honor to, to be with you and with the friends here. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.